Welcome to the Army Contracting Command's Contracting Officer Representative Comprehension Training. This course, in conjunction with other training referenced later, will allow the COR to understand the duties and responsibilities of the position. The terminal learning objective of this training is to prepare the prospective military and government employee to function as a duly appointed Contracting Officer's Representative, the COR, in accordance with the Department of Defense COR Handbook and other policies and regulations. The COR will also be able to use the DOD Contracting Officer Representative Tracking Tool, or CORT tool, to maintain evidence of current required certifications and to self-nominate for the COR role on assigned contracts. The COR will also be able to create monthly contract status reports to the contracting officer, which will provide an assessment of the contractor's performance, as well as uploading trip reports, test results, and other contract-related documentation. This training will include discussions of such topics as background and basics, COR types and training, COR ethics, the appointment letter, use of the DOD core tool, and the COR's roles and responsibilities related to surveillance and inspection. We will also address the quality assurance surveillance plan, government furnished property, assessing the contractor's role in combating trafficking in persons, as well as the use of various computer systems, including IRAPT for reviewing contractor invoices, the Contractor Manpower Reporting System, and the Contractor Performance Assessment Reporting System, or CPARS. The duties and responsibilities of the COR, as well as those of the Procurement Contracting Officer, the PCO, are defined in various regulations and documents. One of those documents is the Federal Acquisition Regulation, known as the FAR which is a document that governs all acquisitions or purchases by the federal government. In addition, there is the Department of Defense supplement to the FAR, the DFARS, which details requirements specific to the DOD, the Army supplement to the FAR, the AFARS, the DOD COR handbook, the Army Contracting Command's ACC pamphlet 70-1, which is the COR policy guide, as well as the COR's appointment letter. A combination of events in the early to mid-1990s, military downsizing and the government's acquisition reform program, led to a situation with an increased number of contractors performing services for the government and less government personnel to provide oversight of those contractors. A review was conducted which looked at the weaknesses created by this situation, and one of the recommendations was to provide standardized training for CORs. Subsequently, several classes were developed by the Defense Acquisition University, or DAU, to address the required training and assure CORs are properly prepared to conduct their COR duties. The COR functions as the eyes and ears of the PCO and performs technical and administrative duties on the PCO's behalf. The COR will be designated in writing, in the appointment letter, to conduct surveillance of the contractor's performance on the contract and report that performance to the PCO. These actions by the COR help ensure that the government is getting what it pays for on the contract. CORs are divided into three categories or types and are designated as Type A, B, or C. A Type A COR will be appointed for contracts that are considered to be of low risk to the government and where the services on that contract are not too complex. A Type B COR will be appointed for more complex contracts which are considered to be other than low risk to the government and a Type C COR is similar to a Type B COR, but has a unique contract requirement that necessitates a professional license, higher education, or specialized training beyond that of a Type B. The training requirements will vary based on the Type COR required. Requirements for a Type A COR include DAU CLC 106, core with the mission focus, DAU CLM 003, overview of acquisition ethics, combating trafficking in persons, wide area workflow, and any mission, local, or theater-specific training as specified by the PCO or requiring activity. The training for a Type B and C COR is essentially the same as that of the Type A COR, with the exception of the substitution of DAU CLC 222 online training for contracting officer representatives in place of the DAU CLC 106. The online training can be found at the sites listed on the slide. There are four general phases to the COR process. The first is the nomination, designation, and appointment phase. This is the phase where the COR will complete any required training, document the completion of that training in the court tool, and assure that there are no conflicts of interest. 
The second phase is the pre-award phase. Pre-award is a term used to describe all of the activities that take place prior to the actual awarding of a contract to a contractor. During this phase, the COR may be asked to use his or her expertise to help develop some of the technical requirements that will become part of the future contract. The third phase is the post-award phase. Post-award refers to those activities that take place after the contract has been awarded. In this phase, the COR will perform the duties designated in the appointment letter, including performing contract surveillance oversight of the contractor's compliance with contract requirements, and providing reports to the PCO on the contractor's performance. The final phase is the termination of the COR's appointment. When the COR becomes aware that he or she will no longer be able to continue to perform the duties appointed, for example, when retiring or transferring to another agency, he or she should immediately inform the PCO so as to allow sufficient time for the PCO to appoint a replacement. It is important to note that only the PCO has the authority to appoint and or terminate a COR. As mentioned in DOD Directive 5500.7R, the Joint Ethics Regulation, and in DAU CLM 003, Overview of Acquisition Ethics, CORs as government employees are held to a different set of rules than that of individuals in the commercial environment. Since CORs are part of the government acquisition process which involves the use of taxpayer money, they must maintain public confidence in the way the government conducts business. The COR must assure that there are no conflicts of interest that may affect the COR's ability to remain impartial and also to avoid situations that may give the appearance that the COR's impartiality has been compromised. It is also important to note that although DOD Directive 5500.7R addresses the acceptance of gifts from contractors under specific circumstances and defined dollar values, that the COR can never solicit gifts from a contractor, regardless of the dollar value. In the event of any ethics concerns, the COR should contact their ethics advisor or legal office for clarification. Welcome to Part 2 of the Army Contracting Command's Contracting Officer Representative Comprehension Training. The COR's authorities and responsibilities are defined in the FAR and the DFARS. The specific duties assigned to the COR will be detailed in the COR's appointment letter from the PCO. Those assigned duties will become part of the COR's annual performance evaluation with input from the PCO to the COR supervisor. It is important to note that all duties delegated to the COR by the PCO must be included in the appointment letter. If a duty is not in the appointment letter, then the COR is not authorized to perform that duty. This is a sample of the COR's appointment letter. The COR will be responsible for all duties detailed in paragraphs 2 through 9, as well as those checked yes in paragraph 1, with those duties detailed in the related paragraphs. Be sure to read all the duties carefully because you are agreeing to perform those duties as described throughout the life of the contract. It is important that the COR have a thorough understanding of the contract on which they will be assessing the contractor's performance. Understand what the contractor's responsibilities are as well as those of the government. The COR should ensure that they have access to the contract and any related documentation, all of which should be available from the PCO. A detailed understanding of the contract requirements will facilitate the performance of the COR's duties. For further information on contracts, including the different contract types, see Chapter 6 of the DoD COR Handbook at the address listed on the slide. Prior to the contract being awarded, the COR can assist the PCO in the requiring activity in the pre-award phase by helping to develop the technical requirements to be included in the contract. The COR may also be asked to assist in preparing the purchase request, conducting market research, preparing independent government cost estimates, and participating in the source selection board. Remember to ensure that all duties performed during this pre-award phase are included in your individual performance appraisal. After the contract is awarded and we enter the post-award phase, the COR has responsibilities that include understanding the terms of the contract, keeping current and complete files, documenting correspondence with the contractor, monitoring the contractor's performance by conducting surveillance, and protecting proprietary and classified information. In addition to the responsibilities detailed in the last slide, the COR is expected to manage technical issues that arise, 
track contract modifications to determine the need to adjust surveillance, provide technical expertise, ensure timely submission of CPARs, and maintain frequent communications with the PCO to provide ongoing details of the contract status. The contract status will be provided at a minimum by completing the required monthly status reports in the core tool. A topic that the COR must be aware of is the constructive change in unauthorized commitment. This is where the contractor performs work that is outside of the scope of the contract based on direction received from government personnel who do not have the authority to direct such work. This often occurs because the contractor's misunderstanding of the apparent or implied authority of the government representative. It is important to remember that the COR does not have the authority to direct the contractor to perform work that is not part of the contract and that the COR can be held financially liable for any costs or damages incurred as a result of exceeding their authority. When the COR is conducting oversight of the contractor's performance and notices deficiencies or unsatisfactory performance, the COR should document all details of the deficiency and notify the PCO immediately. The COR should also contact the contractor's quality assurance personnel and describe the contractual requirements and the deficiency noted. It is also important that all details of the unsatisfactory performance are included in the COR's monthly status report. When contractors fail to meet the delivery or performance schedules in the contract, the PCO can take actions against that contractor. Before making the decision to penalize the contractor, the PCO may ask the COR to assist in evaluating whether the contractor had any control over the delay or if it was caused by circumstances beyond the contractor's control. The COR can use the Contractor Delay Assessment in Appendix F8 of the DOD COR Handbook as a guide in making this determination. Welcome to Part 3 of the Army Contracting Command's Contracting Officer Representative Comprehension Training. The Contracting Officer's Representative Tracking Tool, or CORP Tool, is used DOD-wide as the official COR file. It is used by the COR to track completion of related training, create a COR profile, and to upload monthly status reports and other contract-related documentation. It is also used by the PCO to appoint and terminate the COR, review the COR's monthly status reports, and to evaluate the COR's files. When the COR first enters the court tool, they will be required to create a COR profile. This can be accomplished by selecting COR profile from the menu and completing the required fields, including work address and career experience. The COR will also upload copies of required training certificates that will be reviewed by the PCO when the COR self-nominates. Also when completing the COR's profile, the COR will be required to input information about their current supervisor. If the supervisor has a current WAWF account, the COR can select the supervisor from the pull-down list, which will then auto-populate the supervisor's information. If the supervisor does not have an account, the COR should select None from the pull-down and ask the supervisor to create an account in WAWF. The COR can later update the supervisor's information. To act as a COR on a particular contract, the COR must first self-nominate to perform the duties on that contract. This is done by selecting COR nomination process from the court tool menu. The COR will then complete the requested information, including details about the contracting center and the contract. This information can be obtained from the PCO or the contract specialist. If the contract number is known at the time of self-nomination, select yes and input the contract number. If the contract number is not known at this time, select No and input the pre-award number as provided by the PCO. The COR will then review and certify several statements about their responsibilities in self-nominating to be a COR and submit the nomination to their supervisor. The supervisor will then review and certify statements concerning the supervisor's responsibilities relating to the COR and will submit it to the PCO. The PCO will review the certifications and evaluate the COR's qualifications to perform the required functions and officially appoint the COR through the court tool. The COR is required to provide a report on the status of the contract to the PCO on a monthly basis. 
This is done in court by selecting the Smart Form button and completing the system generated report, or selecting the Add button and uploading an offline report if authorized by the PCO. The COR can also upload various additional documentation such as trip reports, correspondence reports, and other miscellaneous documents. Use the WAWF training link listed to access additional information on getting started in court, several court training videos, and various court-related documentation. Also, if you experience problems with court, contact the Court Tool Help Desk using the contact information listed on the slide. Welcome to Part 4 of the Army Contracting Command's Contracting Officer Representative Comprehension Training. Surveillance of the contractor by the government is required by the FAR and DFARS and provides support to the customer. Government surveillance can help assess how well contractors are performing and determine if cost, schedule, and quality requirements are being met. Surveillance may also help the COR discover areas where improvements may be needed, which the COR can recommend to the PCO. Government surveillance can be either scheduled or unscheduled. Scheduled surveillance is performing actions that have been pre-planned and documented in and performed in accordance with the monthly surveillance schedule. Unscheduled surveillance is when the COR performs actions that are not part of the original surveillance schedule but are deemed necessary by the COR. These can be items identified in the QASP but performed outside of the schedule or actions not identified in the QASP. This is an example of a surveillance schedule that the COR would use to plan which tasks will be evaluated on specified days for the month. Each task to be evaluated relates back to a task detailed in the PWS of the contract. There is no specified format for a surveillance schedule, so CORs are free to create their own or to tailor them to their individual needs. Note that once the surveillance schedule is completed with the dates that each PWS item will be evaluated, it should be treated as an official government document and not shared with the contractor. The surveillance checklist details what characteristics the COR will use to evaluate each of the tasks identified in the surveillance schedule. It should include measurable performance standards and will be used as the basis for the COR's assessment of the contractor's performance. This is a portion of a surveillance checklist used to monitor the contractor's performance on a black and gray water removal contract. Note that the evaluation criteria is clearly defined and that each relates to a specific portion of the contract's PWS. The COR will document whether the contractor met each requirement and will provide details to support each assessment. When conducting surveillance, the COR should notify the contractor's quality assurance personnel upon arrival and then perform their surveillance in accordance with their QASP and surveillance schedule. Results of the surveillance will be documented using the surveillance checklist. The COR will then brief the contractor's personnel of the results of the surveillance and provide written deficiency reports if applicable. The completed surveillance schedule and checklist should be uploaded into the court tool at the same time the COR completes their monthly status report in the system. Different inspection methods can be used by the COR to evaluate the contractor's performance. An inspection is defined as the examination or testing of supplies or services to determine whether they conform to contract requirements. The frequency of government inspection will be determined by the circumstances of the individual contract and can occur daily, weekly, monthly, etc., and must continue throughout the life of the contract. There are five acceptable inspection methods that can be used by the COR. The first is 100% inspection. This is where all outputs or services are monitored. This is normally used only for complex, critical, or life support services due to the extensive time and expense involved. The next method is random inspection, where a sample of all outputs or services are evaluated and are representative of the entire lot. The sample should be randomly chosen and a valid sample size used. The third method is planned inspection. This is used when the contract has scheduled milestones, 
tests, or predetermined inspection points. Periodic inspection is another method that can be used to monitor contractor performance. It is generally used to monitor things like protection of supplies and storage, or around-the-clock support to the customer. The last method that can be used is customer complaints, which might be cards that the customer can complete to show dissatisfaction with contractor performance. All customer complaints must be verified by the COR. This is a table of inspection sample sizes that can be used with the random inspection method. Generally, the COR will use the column labeled Normal Sample Size to determine the number of items to be evaluated based on the original lot size. The location of government inspections will be specified in the contract as either source or destination. Source usually refers to the contractor's facility where items will be built and tested. Destination will be used for commercial or off-the-shelf items and the place of performance for service contracts. Welcome to Part 5 of the Army Contracting Command's Contracting Officer Representative Comprehension Training. The Quality Assurance Surveillance Plan, or QASP, is the government's inspection plan. It documents the methods and metrics used to measure contractor performance against the requirements of the contract. The QASP also describes the COR's plan for surveying and documenting who, what, when, where, and how the contractor will be monitored. The use of a QASP is mandated by the DFARS, which states that a QASP will be developed and used by the COR on all service contracts and that it should address performance risks inherent in the individual contract. The QASP is based on performance requirements of the contract, but is not considered part of the contract. The QASP should be updated as contract risk or requirements change. It should also be used as the basis for monthly status reports submitted to the PCO. When developing the QASP, focus on the contractor's performance requirements and the contractor's quality control plan if applicable. The QASP should detail the critical tasks to be evaluated and the frequency of the evaluations, along with the surveillance methods to be used. The COR's documentation requirements should also be addressed. The components listed here should be included in the QASP to provide a complete understanding of the details involved in the government's oversight of the contractor's performance on the contract. Be sure to capture each component when creating the QASP. Please click on the link shown on the slide to view a video that provides complete information on the development, details, and use of the QASP. Welcome to Part 6 of the Army Contracting Command's Contracting Officer Representative Comprehension Training. Government Furnished Property, or GFP, is property that is owned by the government and temporarily provided to the contractor for use during the performance of a specified contract. Allowing contractors to use GFP can result in lower prices for the government, expedited contract delivery, and can assist small businesses by allowing them to perform on government contracts that they may not otherwise be able to bid on. FAR Part 52-245-1, Government Property, describes the responsibilities of both the contractor and the government when GFP is included in a contract. For example, the contractor is responsible to protect and maintain and keep records of accountability of all GFP. The government is responsible to provide GFP to the contractor in a condition to function as intended. This slide lists several responsibilities that the COR may have when GFP is involved in the contract, including assuring that the contractor uses the GFP only on authorized contracts and that the contractor maintains and protects the GFP. Also, it is important that the COR alert the PCO when there is a possibility that delivery of GFP by the government to the contractor may be delayed.
FAR Clause 52-222-50, Combating Trafficking in Persons, is mandatory in all solicitations and contracts. It states that the United States government has a zero-tolerance policy regarding trafficking in persons and that contractors must inform their employees of this policy and take action against employees who violate this requirement. CORs are required by the DFARS to read and understand the requirements of the FAR clause as it relates to trafficking in persons. CORs must be aware of how contractors treat their employees and remain alert for any indications of violation. If trafficking in persons is suspected, make a mental note of the details and when safely away from the site, notify the PCO of your suspicions. It is important for your own safety to not relay your suspicions of trafficking in persons to the contractor. CORs are required to address in their QASP how they will oversight the contractor's compliance to the requirements of combating trafficking in persons. The COR can use this slide and include it in their QASP to detail the performance indicators, performance standards, and methods of surveillance they will use to assess the contractor's compliance. The COR may be designated by the PCO to review and accept invoices submitted by the contractor using the WAWF module called Invoicing, Receipt, Acceptance, and Property Transfer, or IRAPT. Acceptance in IRAPT constitutes acknowledgement that supplies or services conform to contract quality and quantity requirements. CORs shall ensure that all invoices are given prompt attention usually within five days. The invoice should be reviewed for accuracy to the contract requirements, and if discrepancies are identified, the invoice should be rejected in IRAP and the PCO notified immediately. This slide lists some of the common discrepancies noted by CORs when reviewing invoices in IRAP. When the COR rejects an invoice for these or other discrepancies, the COR will provide a description of the discrepancy in IRAP. The rejected invoice will then be returned automatically to the contractor for correction and resubmission. Further training on IRAPT is available at the address listed on the slide. Welcome to Part 7 of the Army Contracting Command's Contracting Officer Representative Comprehension Training. Contractor Manpower Reporting, or CMR, is a database that contractors are required to use to allow the government to account for the total contractor workforce. It assists the government in making more informed staffing and funding decisions and helps to avoid duplications of effort. Contractor manpower reporting is required by DOD for all service contracts except classified contracts. All reporting is done by the contractor using the Contractor Manpower Reporting Application, or CMRA. The contractor must complete one report per year per contract during the life of the contract. The data must be entered by the contractor no later than October 31st each year. When delegated CMR responsibilities in their appointment letter, the COR is required to create their own CMRA account to verify that the contractor has entered the required data and to validate the man hours entered. The COR will also be required to enter the fund site data in CMRA. Completion of these duties should be mentioned in the COR's monthly status report. This slide shows the CMRA fund site details page where the COR will input the fund site data. The numbers on the left side correspond to data inputs that will be extracted from the Form 1095-G, shown on the next slide. The Form 1095-G can be obtained from the PCO or the contract specialist. The details for each of the fields on the CMRA Fund Site Details page, shown on the previous slide, can be obtained by using the information in the highlighted fields on the Form 1095-G which pertain to the corresponding numbers shown. The Contractor Performance Assessment Reporting System, or CPARS, 
is an application that collects details of the contractor's performance on government contracts. This information is used by source selection boards to assist in future contract award decisions. The COR is generally tasked with collecting and reporting the contractor's performance information. Be sure to keep adequate records relating to the contractor's performance as this will be used to complete the assessment of the contractor's performance in CPARS. If CPARS responsibility is designated in the COR's appointment letter, the COR should complete their portion of the assessment in a timely manner to assure the CPAR completes the entire process within the 120-day time limit. The COR should rate the contractor's performance within the parameters requested by the PCO. The rating should be fair and factual and supported by a narrative that provides enough detail to fully explain the rating. The COR should be aware that the narrative is the most important part of the assessment and should provide the reader a complete understanding of the contractor's performance. Further information and training can be found by clicking the link on the slide.